Please take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, our text tonight will be verses 35 to 37. You'll also find our text printed out for you in our order of service, our worship booklet. If you were able to download that for tonight, you'll find it there as well. As we are coming to the end of this, the, the greatest chapter in the Bible, in many ways in God's providence, this text is most fitting for a night like tonight's. We've already heard it throughout our service. Jesus, the Lamb of God, the one who takes away the sin of the world. It was a Passover night 2,000 years ago when our Lord Jesus ate that meal with his disciples and told them the words that we've heard, that he must go from them. But he goes to accomplish their salvation, yes. Goes to show them how much he love them, which gets right at the heart, the question that our hearts long to have an answer for, a question concerning the love of God for us in Jesus Christ. That's what we'll hear of tonight. But in order to hear it with ears that are spiritual ears, ears that are able to believe what they hear because they hear enlivened by the spirit of the living God, we need to ask the spirit for his help. So let's do that now. Would you pray with me, please? Almighty God, we do come tonight around your word. And once again, we ask that you would pour out your spirit upon us. Oh, Holy Spirit, come open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts. So that we might say this night of all nights, hallelujah, what a savior. As we see your great love for us and we know it and we feel it and we're assured of it all this we long for lord do your work we pray we ask it in jesus name amen so romans chapter 8 our text tonight verses 35 to 37 but we'll back up to verse 31 what then shall we say to these things if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So it was very early in my ministry, but I won't forget it. I was working with an older pastor, helping him out with whatever he or the church needed. And on that day, he was discouraged. A significant family in our congregation had just told them that they were leaving the church. And when he told me that, well, I asked him why. And, and he gave me the reason that they said, and I confess I don't remember the reason now to this day, but I do remember what he said next. Because these are words that have rung in my head and my heart words that I have used repeatedly throughout my ministry. He said, well, but Sean, you need to know, the reason's never the reason. And you know that's true. The reasons that people tell you for what they are doing and why they're doing it, they, they may be part of the story, but, but those reasons don't get down to the real reason. 
the real reason that they may not even be able to articulate, the reason that's deep in their heart that they can't even out for what they are doing, the real reason. But we might feel the same way about this section of Romans chapter 8. After all, the Apostle Paul has been summing up his entire argument in this chapter that began back in verse 1 with which we began on the first Sunday of January. And, and here over the last couple of times we've been together, we've heard him sum up his entire argument with a series of rhetorical questions, seven in all. We've heard him say, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will we not also with him graciously give us all things? Who, who shall bring in any charge against God's elect? Who is to condemn? And all of those questions, they're good questions. But they're not the question. The question that our hearts long to have an answer for, they're not the real question. No, the real question's right there in verse 35. And you see it in your Bibles. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? That's the question, isn't it? That's the real question that our hearts want to know. Is it possible for us to be separated from Christ's love? Is it possible for someone to intervene, to, to stand between, to somehow block out Christ's love from us? Could, could, it, could anyone possibly drive a wedge between Christ's love and us? That's the real question. Now, we know in our heads, those of us have been in this church business for a while, we know in our heads that the answer is no. But our hearts, oh, our hearts, they doubt and they fear and they question and they wonder. And, and it doesn't help when a range of troubles as varied as a rogues gallery plague us. And his final rhetorical question, Paul lists seven rogues that, that cause us to doubt and to wonder and to fear whether or not Christ loves us. You see them in the lineup? You see them there in verse 35? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? It's quite a lineup. Tribulation is first. That's a general word for trouble. It's a word that Paul will use 21 times throughout his letters. Sometimes these are troubles that, that we get ourselves into. Sometimes these are troubles that others bring to us, but make no mistake, they are troubles, tribulations nonetheless. Next in the lineup, distress, hardship. It's another word that shows up throughout Paul's letters, especially in 2 Corinthians, where three different times he will list all of the distresses, all of the hardships that he knew for following Christ and engaged in his ministry. After that, you have the four horsemen of opposition, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger. All things Paul knew, all things the believers throughout the ages have known. And then finally, the worst bandit, the worst rogue of them all, the sword. The possibility, the likelihood even of martyrdom for the believer, for Paul, whether through Rome's verdict or through a Jew's ambush, seven rogues in the gallery, seven rogues that might cause anyone to wonder or to doubt, to question or to fear whether Christ's love is real and true and for me. Of course, these days our rogues might have different names. COVID-19 or unemployment, four horsemen that ride together, isolation, despair, addiction, depression, and even, even suicidal thoughts. And these rogues, they rise up 
in our heads and in our hearts. They wedge their way in. They cause us to ask the real question that we want to know. Is it possible? Is it possible that I might be separated from Christ's love? Here's the reality, though. That's always been the question for God's people. God followers for centuries, even for millennia, have asked that same question. And Paul shows us that by quoting another Old Testament text. If you're keeping count, this is actually the third reference in these summary questions to the Old Testament. We saw in verse 32 when, when Paul asked if God did not spare his own son but deliver him up for us all. Paul was reaching back to Genesis 22 to the scene with, with Abraham and Isaac. And the fact Isaac did not spare his own son. And then last time in verses 33 and 34, we saw how Paul was reaching back to, to Zechariah chapter 3. When Joshua, the high priest, the representative of the people, had the accuser standing right beside him, Satan, in the great courtroom of God. And yet God rebuked the accuser by pointing to Joshua and, by extension, God's people's election and justification and answering all the questions, the accusations of the devil. Well, here again, Paul reaches back to the Old Testament, and now it's Psalm 44. And if you were to read Psalm 44, you'd find that it is a corporate lament. It's a song of grieving that the people of God would sing together. God's people have experienced a calamity. One that, that has made them feel as though God has rejected us and disgraced us. And this has happened even though God's people were faithful. Even though God's people had been keeping covenant with him. The psalm writer says in Psalm 44, verse 17, We have not forgotten you. We have not been false to your covenant. Our heart is not turned back, nor have our steps departed from your way. Seems to be no good reason for these things happening. And despite all of this, twice in Psalm 44, you hear the language of God's people feeling as though they're being led as sheep to the slaughterhouse. First, in verse 11, you have made us like sheep for slaughter and have scattered us among the nations. And then again in the section that Paul quotes, which is Psalm 44, verse 22, yet for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. And so the psalmist begs God at the end of the psalm, rise up. Come to our help. Redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. You see, the psalmist has the same question. If we are being led as sheep to the slaughter by these rogues, can we be certain of your steadfast love? None of this is new. This is the way of God's people. We are plagued by various rogues that seek to do us great damage and they make us doubt and wonder and fear about God's love for us, which is why Paul's assurance is, reassurance is so important for our hearts. You see it in verse 37. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors. In all these things. In other words, each one of these rogues will be defeated. They will be overcome, but, but the victory may not come as we expect. It's interesting that elsewhere in the New Testament, the root word that gets translated in our ESV Bibles more than conquers, it speaks of believers who win an overwhelming victory in the face of trouble and persecution by not denying the name of Christ even in the face of death. You see, it's not as though trouble or distress, persecution or famine, naked dangers or, dangers or sword no longer will, will trouble us. It's not that the virus will be gone and we'll be able to come together again and we'll have good work to, go, to do and we'll enjoy the good life again and it'll all be back to normal. No, the reassurance that Paul gives us is that despite the worst that the rogues can do and do do, they will not conquer us. They will not cause our faith to fail. 
They will not crush us and they will not separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. We are more than conquerors when we hold fast to our faith in Jesus. In the face of all that is awful and wrong and dark and broken in this world. He is the good that's worth fighting for. There's this great speech right towards the end of the two towers, the second of the Lord of the Rings films based off of J.R. Tolkien's books. Frodo is about ready to give up, but his trusted companion, Samwise Gamgee, he refuses to let him do so, and he gives him this word of encouragement when Frodo feels he can't go on. He says, I know it's all wrong. By rights, we shouldn't even be here, but we are. It's like in the great stories, Mr. Frodo, the ones that really mattered, full of darkness and danger they were, and, and sometimes you didn't want to know the end because of how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was when so much bad has happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing, this shadow. Even the darkness must pass, and a new day will come. When the sun shines, it will shine out the clearer. Folks in those stories had lots of chances of turning back, only they didn't because they were holding on to something. But there was some good in this world, Mr. Frodo, and it's worth fighting for. Yes. Yes, the world is dark, and there are rogues about, and there are things that cause us to fear and falter and fall. But we are more than conquerors because we're holding on to someone who is so good. Or, or better, Jesus is the reason we hold on because he is holding on to us. What does Paul say? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Remember, the real question is whether anyone or anything could possibly separate us from the love of Jesus. And Paul's answer here is no. We will not falter or fail. The rogues will not crush us. We will overcome through Jesus who loved us and who loves us. And of course, that's what this night of all nights is about, isn't it? You've already heard it in the reading from John chapter 13. Do you remember how it began? It's right there in your worship booklets. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He loved them to the end. How did Jesus love his disciples? Better, how did Jesus love you and me? To the end? Friends, Jesus loved us to the end by knowing tribulation. You remember it in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was so overcome by the cup that was being held out before him that he fell on his face before God and cried out three times, My God, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. His soul, he said to his disciples, was deeply troubled. That's how much he loved. How much he loved you. He loved you to the end also by experiencing distress. There in the garden he prayed in such a way and with such intensity that he sweat drops of blood. That's how anguished his soul was for you. He loved you to the end by experiencing persecution. Bound by the, by the rabble led by Judas, bound like a Passover lamb, drugged to the Sanhedrin, falsely accused there and convicted, falsely accused and convicted before Pilate, wrongly beaten by the Praetorian guard. Here is persecution indeed. Here is his love for you. He loved you to the end by knowing famine, going throughout that Good Friday day without a thing to eat save for a few drops of vinegar offered to him on a sponge. And he loved you to the end by experiencing nakedness, 
when he was stripped of his clothes, those clothes that the soldiers played for with dice at the foot of the cross while he was gasping for breath. He loved you to the end by tasting danger, the danger of the wrath of God that came at that noon hour when the world went dark. And he loved you, my friend, all the way to the end by dying by the sword, by dying of crucifixion as a criminal, and yet, as the placard said over his head, as the king of the Jews. This is how Jesus shows you how much he loved you and how he loved you to the end. All the rogues did their worst against him. He was killed all the day long. Indeed, Jesus was the sheep who was led to the slaughterhouse. Yes, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The sheep to be slaughtered, as Isaiah 53 told us. The Lamb that, that we laid our hands upon when we grabbed hold of him by faith. And we placed our hands on his head and confessed all of our sin and all of our sinning and all of our guilt and all of our shame. All that we knew and all that we do not know, all was placed on the head of the Lamb of God. It was transferred to him. And he died for it. And when he cried out, it is finished. It was the end of our sin and sinning, yes. But it was also the end of all those rogues. It was the beginning of the end for all that is dark and evil and broken in this world. It is finished means that, that viruses and unemployment and fear and panic and depression and despair and addiction and suicide and death, they all will pass. They'll all pass because Jesus said it is finished. It is finished means that a new day is coming when the sun shines because Jesus reigns as the one raised from the dead and ruling at the right hand of the Father. It is finished means that a new world is coming where the sun will shine clear because the glory of God will cover this world as the waters cover the sea. And Jesus went through all of this, all the way to the end, all the way to the finishing line. Because he loves you as his own. And he loves you to the end. And that's the answer to your question, you know. The question that you really have deep in your heart. The question you're really asking, whether you know it or not. Who will separate me? You. Us. From the love of Christ. And what Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and Easter Sunday tell us is that no one, not a single one, will separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Because when Jesus loves, he loves always and forever, all the way to the end. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Oh, Father, through the Son, by the Spirit, we come to you. And we stand amazed tonight. We say with the hymn writer, what wondrous love is this. That you would love us in this way. That you would love us by taking on all the rogues, all of our enemies that oppose us. And you would utterly defeat them through the cross and the empty tomb. Lord, our world is dark right now. We feel the darkness. And yet, Lord Jesus, it's in the darkness that your light shines. And the darkness will not overcome your light. And we look forward to the day when the sun shall shine all the brighter and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess because they have seen the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Until that day, O oh God, 
Grant us confidence that we might be sure that nothing and no one can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. We pray it in Jesus' name.